How little we know How much to discover What chemical This is Mary Toomey, co-director of the National Center on Elder Abuse. This podcast is a product of the NCEA, directed by the U.S. Administration on Aging. NCEA helps communities, agencies, and organizations ensure that elders and adults with disabilities can live with dignity and without abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Based at the University of California, Irvine's Center of Excellence on Elder Abuse and Neglect in the program in geriatrics, the NCEA is the place to turn for education, research, and promising practices in stopping abuse. Our guest today is Dr. Mark Lax. Dr. Lax is a geriatrician and researcher at the Weill Cornell School of Medicine in New York. He is also director of the New York City Elder Abuse Center. We sat down with Dr. Lax during his visit to UC Irvine. We're so grateful to you to take the time to talk with us today. I wanted to start by asking you, what interested you in doing research in elder mistreatment? So after I completed uh, internal medicine training, uh, I did a program at Yale called the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, which is a a research methodology fellowship that uh, asked uh, newly minted physicians to study medical problems as they intersected uh, with society. And, uh, you know, clinically, I was interested in both emergency medicine and in geriatrics and uh, used to support my student loan habit, moonlighting in the Yale emergency room. And uh, I will not forget that one night uh, a woman came in with uh, cigarette burns on her chest, uh, an elderly woman. And uh, that was horrifying enough. Uh, And then went back to uh, look at her medical records. Those were the days where we did not have electronic medical records. And uh, so the medical records department dutifully sent this tome of records. And when I look back over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, she had been a victim of domestic violence her entire life. She had been admitted uh, over and over again. No one had really made the diagnosis. She was accused of being hysterical or histrionic by emergency room physicians. And this was just um, compelling. And it occurred at a time when um, I was studying to learn about societal problems in medicine. So it just all came together as sort of the perfect storm of of intellectual interest and the coursework that I was engaged in. Well, lucky for us that that happened. (laughs) That's so kind of you. One of the uh, struggles I feel for myself as someone who is very interested in keeping abreast of what's, what's new and good in elder abuse is how will I know whether the research piece that I'm reading in whatever periodical that I'm looking at is a, is a good piece of research or not such a good piece of research? Now, I'm wondering if you could give some of our listeners tips on what can they be looking for that would tell them, this is, this is a solid piece of research and I can, I can trust these findings, I can apply these findings to my practice. Well, you know, as with any type of uh, medical or sociologic research, Mary, uh, there are a few sort of basic criteria that I teach students and even lay people to effectively think about when they look at a research uh, paper. The first is, is that has a specific question been articulated? What does this study purport to do? Is this a study that effectively wants to look at the prevalence of mistreatment in a population or whether or not an intervention worked. And uh, uh, it sounds silly, but often I read a scientific paper, particularly about domestic violence or elder abuse, and I can't really tell what the investigators were, were up to. So that's, that's, that's number one. After that, um, I like a very clear description of methods and the study population. Um, who were they uh, evaluating? Who is subject to the, um, the intervention or observation? Um, and that's important because if you're a clinician in practice, you want to know whether or not uh, the patients or clients that you're caring for are like the people in the study so that you can really generalize the results to someone you're worried about, an elder abuse victim in your particular orbit. So um, if this is a study of patients who are in adult daycare or in nursing homes, this would not be applicable. That's an extreme example for a community-based individual to the extent that they describe their functional impairments or their uh, impairments in activity of daily living. That's very important. Otherwise, you can't understand um, who you're studying. If it's an intervention study, 
Mary, there are two things that I really think readers or listeners should uh, think about. The first is, has the intervention been carefully described and is it replicable? So um, if they say, we did psychotherapy, uh, as a bad example, on a group of individuals or victims of mistreatment, that doesn't help me. That's not something that I could replicate in my environment. I don't know if their uh, psychotherapist was the same as mine. I don't know what the kind of psychotherapy is. But if they went on to describe an invention where, say, for example, um, three times a week we had uh, supportive cognitive behavioral therapy in this environment, uh, and it was delivered in this way, and in the back in the article, here's a reference for how we do this, then I feel much better about that because then you can begin to apply that uh, that strategy in your particular uh, population. The second thing that uh, I would emphasize in an intervention study um, is the presence of some kind of control group. So uh, it's not enough to simply say we delivered this intervention in a group of elder abuse people and they got better. Um, I want to see some reasonable attempt to create a, a control or comparison group that is in some way like uh, the individuals that were receiving the intervention. So similar degrees of cognitive impairment, social support, uh, uh, functional disability. And uh, from there, uh, you know, I begin to feel a bit more comfortable that the study is of reasonable quality. It feels to me like we have not yet reached the point where we're hearing a lot about research in prevention or intervention in elder abuse cases. And can you tell us why that might be? Well, I, I agree with you, um, and uh, I think the major reason is uh, is that this research is incredibly difficult to do. If I'm uh, a, a scientist who studies uh, hypertension in patients and I want to give drug A to one group and drug B to another group, I can measure the intervention. I know what the pill looks like. It's the same in California as it is in New York. I can measure their blood pressures. So I have very discrete outcomes in terms of uh, you know what I'm measuring. It's a number, the degree to which your blood pressure falls. And um, those patients, uh, pardon the expression, generally behave in clinical studies. They come back. They can express uh, content or discontent with the treatment. They can tell you what side effects they're having. I wish we had the luxury of having those kinds of subjects in our studies, but the truth is, is that our subjects are often frail. They're isolated. They're cognitively impaired. We may have to do them in the setting of an abuser in the environment. Um, there's high rates of attrition. Patients become sick. They enter the hospital. They have intercurrent medical illnesses, strokes, heart attacks. They may enter a nursing home and leave our studies completely. And then the complexity I talked about in the previous question when I was responding about how the interventions have to be the same uh, and delivered by the same individuals or similar individuals with a script, this is remarkably difficult research to do. So progress has been uh, incredibly slow. There's been another problem, which is we have tend to lump in our field all kinds of mistreatment together in doing research. So you might have people who are uh, physically abused, psychologically abused, and financially exploited in the study. Uh, and then uh, subject them all to the same uh, uh, intervention, and that's improper. It's not the way we practice elder abuse intervention in clinical practice. The truth is about elder abuse, as I'm sure you're aware and your listeners are aware, you've seen one case, you've seen one case. And to think that uh, a man who is being beaten by his schizophrenic adult child is going to respond to the same intervention as um, a stressed-out caregiver who's dealing with dementia-related behavioral problems is crazy. Yet much of the research that we see uh, lumps those folks together, and what comes out at the end is really useful to none of those groups. So um, I would make a plea for us to do smaller studies of high quality using relatively homogeneous populations and fairly um, short and describable and reproducible interventions. What's on the horizon for research in elder abuse? All kinds of interesting challenges in difficult uh, and different areas. I, I see um, in financial exploitation, which is ripe, I see um, all kinds of interesting uh, information technology solutions that look at the way older people and younger people spend money and how we might track patterns of purchasing, the way your credit card company might effectively uh, you know, call you when they think something's amiss. Uh, and uh, here I think that data mining and those kinds of interventions will be really, really interesting uh, for uh, uh, nursing home residents. Uh, my recent work has been in the area of resident to resident elder mistreatment, ag aggression between nursing home residents, a totally unexplored field that is extremely common. People have been all 
worried about staff abuse of residents. I am too. I don't think it's as frequent as the as the public would have you believe or the newspapers would have you believe. And I think that dementia patients living together who are physically aggressive and assaultive is a bigger problem. I think in uh, the cases of uh, dementia and other forms of mistreatment, I think we're beginning to see from, from your group and Dr. Mosqueda very, very homogeneous studies of patients with specific kinds of clinical uh, pro, uh, profiles uh, with dementia, for example, in stress caregiving environments where very clever and careful interventions have been um, proffered. And uh, there's just a, for anybody starting to do research in this field, uh, just a tremendously large number of exciting areas. And then lastly, I just point out the whole uh, forensic uh, uh, multidisciplinary team movement, uh, and you guys are at the vanguard of this, we're starting to think about ways to reasonably assess the outcomes of these multidisciplinary teams, which feel really good, probably have better outcomes for patients and support the clinicians who are trying to care and provide service to these people. And we're thinking about novel strategies in which to evaluate them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me, Mary. Uh, have me back again. little we know Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about elder abuse research, download education and public awareness tools, or get involved by making your voice heard, visit the National Center on Elder Abuse's website at www.ncea dot aoa dot gov again www.ncea dot aoa dot gov you can also visit the center of excellence on elder abuse and neglect at university of california irvine's program in geriatrics at our website at www dot center on elder abuse dot org